My name's Steve Wolford, and we, in this church, uh, around this time of the evening, we, uh, we have some teaching from the Bible. As someone explained earlier, we're, we're working through a, a series at the moment called Transforming for Good. And you have heard seven stories of how God has transformed individual lives. And every story is unique. But we believe God's power is so great that he not only transforms individual lives, but he, he has the power to transform all kinds of situations. And uh, the topic for what I'm going to speak to you for a while about tonight is, is transforming poverty. And uh, as I say, we're looking at a, a book uh, called uh, Nehemiah. It takes us back to around 400 BC, would you believe, when the remnant of a, a scattered nation uh, came together to rebuild the walls of their capital city and to rebuild the nation under the leadership of this guy called uh, Nehemiah. Now, if I was writing the Bible, I think the bit of the story that we're looking at tonight, I would have missed it out. Uh, because after the start of the, the building project, uh, it, which went so well, things go uh, pear-shaped. But I have to say, I, I love the Bible for its earthy reality in situations like that. This, this book, the Bible, isn't a, a proper propaganda document. It, it's not a book that's trying to put a positive spin on all things God-related. It's really happy to reveal serious weaknesses of its key players. And um, what's happened in this story is that the community that has worked together uh, so heroically on, on rebuilding the city walls, overcoming all kinds of external enemies, uh, is now experiencing some, some serious internal problems in their community. And it's creating tensions to the extent that it's, it's threatening to tear them apart. But we're going we're gonna to read it or I'm going to read it anyway. It's a, it's a fairly long chapter, so please bear with it. You may want to look out for what I believe is probably the, 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 a, a reference to the, the first carvery in the existence of the world, okay? Listen out for that. So this is Nehemiah 5, and the words will appear on the screen. Now, there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell out your brothers, that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the torts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. 
Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six sheep and birds, and every day, every 10 days, all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my, God, for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. There may be some of you that are just wondering right now, what on earth am I doing here? You may have come because someone you know has been baptized and you've come out of politeness, you wanted to come, but you weren't expecting to hear some old guy standing and talking about things that happened two and a half thousand years ago. And you're wondering, what is the relevance of this to me? Well, we're talking about transforming poverty. My hope is that at very least, if as a result of the next half hour, we can do something more about poverty in our city or in our nation, that will be time well spent. But the extraordinary thing to me is when you read that passage, it, it seems so familiar with our day and age. You'll find there's, there's references to mortgages and loans and debts and taxations, uh, taxation systems and uh, the slave trade. These are issues that we are so familiar with ourselves, but they had an additional problem. Here's the big problem that they were facing back then. It's one of famine. It's serious food shortages. Now, I don't know if anybody has experienced that in a serious kind of way. I know some of us will have experienced going without a meal, or perhaps going without, a, without food for a day or more, and that, that is really hard. And if you're anything like me, when you go without food for any kind of period of time, you fix your mind on when you're going to eat again, precisely, and, and what you're going to eat. But you know, if you're in a situation where you never know when you're going to eat next, that, that leads to some real desperation. And that coupled with the fact that this nation were, uh, were, were still really in, in many ways under occupation or under ownership by the Persian king. They, and they had to supply, they had to pay a heavy tax to the Persian king. Those two things together, famine and taxation, meant there were serious problems for them as a, as a community. People were having to sell their, their right of ownership to, to land and property so they could buy grain, so they could cover taxes. Some of them were having to take out loans at excessive rates of interest. And perhaps most awful of all was that some that could not keep up with their, the interest repayments or they couldn't pay back their loans were, were actually having to sell family members, including children, into slavery. Imagine the horror of that. Something that I'm sure the vast, vast majority of us in this room would never have had to face. And in normal circumstances, making loans and profits, that's just normal, commercial, uh, that, that, that thing happens normally. You wouldn't be surprised by that. But in, in days like this particularly, where the richest and the strongest were taking advantage of the poorest and the weakest, this was absolutely wicked. And the most shocking thing of all was that the people that were abusing others in this situation, it weren't some invading foreign power, it, it was their own nation, it was their own brothers. You probably don't need me to remind you, but we have problems in our own nation. We have actually some issues that are similar to this. In, 
Since Easter of last year, a half a million people in our nation have had to visit food banks to obtain food. Now, you can't just roll up at a food bank and ask for food. You have to be referred. There are certain criteria you have to go through. Uh, it makes it quite serious. Half a million have been through that process. We have a uh, food bank that's associated with our, our Shoreham site. Uh, and in the last two months, they've given food to 100 families just in that part of the city. You know, in some London boroughs, at least half the children are living in poverty. It's estimated that three million people in the UK are suffering from malnourishment. It's called the silent killer. Increasingly, elderly people are dying in their homes and lying undiscovered for weeks. These are awful statistics about our nation. And we live in a nation and a, and a city that, that rightly wants to see the end of world poverty. And yet sometimes we don't always realize uh, how much poverty there is on our doorstep. And the solutions seem so elusive. But we hear in 400 BC, in this particular situation, a solution did come. And by the end of the chapter, if you followed me as I was reading it, the situation had dramatically improved. And Nehemiah as governor, his, his contribution was massive. But something bigger was going on here than Nehemiah. As you read this passage, what you see is, is God at work in the whole community. Rulers, officials, priests, and people all working together. But there was a trigger that started to bring about a solution. And that trigger was that Nehemiah got angry. He got very angry. Now, even today, as we'll find out in a few moments, Nehemiah wasn't perfect. But right through this book that we're looking at, we, we find that actually he, he looks a lot like the perfect ruler to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, when he came, actually, he demonstrated uh, anger uh, on a number of, of occasions, very righteous anger. You see, anger is a very powerful motivating force. And Nehemiah got very angry, it says, when he heard the outcry of the people, when he heard the full extent of what had been happening. He didn't overlook it. He didn't excuse it. He burst into action. Now, if you're anything like me, I, I find it difficult sometimes to even watch the news. Sometimes I, I just don't want to see or hear about situations of extreme poverty and suffering. There's something in me that just wants to just keep it uh, at arm's distance. It's difficult to know how to process those kind of emotions. It's not something I'm proud of. We don't always like hearing outcries, but Nehemiah heard this outcry. And you know, when we, when we do hear something that shocks us on the news, it, it's right, it's good that it should disturb us. It really should make us angry. The sad thing is that that anger sometimes, and very often in fact, it fades almost as quickly as the images on the screens that we have been watching. But you know for some people, Nehemiah types, there's an anger that comes that once it's ignited, it, it lasts a lifetime. I don't know how many of you would know much of the story of William Wilberforce, a British politician lived in the 17 1800s, but when he saw the condition on slave ships, it said uh, it's like a rage gripped his soul uh, that never left him, and he gave his entire life to, towards the abolishing of slavery. Martin Luther King recounts how, as a young man, he was traveling on a bus uh, with an older black lady, and when the bus filled up, the, the bus driver uh, rather rudely said to them they needed to vacate their seats for white people to sit down. He had to stand with this older black lady in the bus for an hour and a half. He said he had never been so angry in his life. And that's what really birthed in him that whole civil rights campaign of the 1960s. Some of you may even be old enough just to remember the Live Aid concerts of uh, 1980 when Bob Geldof, uh, shocked by the suffering that he witnessed in Africa, put on those 
concerts to raise resources for poverty in Africa. You see, anger is a very powerful emotion, and out of it, much can sometimes be accomplished. And so, I am tonight giving you permission to get angry. Now, there are many warnings in the Bible about anger that we do well to heed, but we also need to know that it is commanded. It is commanded that we get angry. There's a verse in the New Testament in Ephesians 4, verse 26. It says this, be angry and do not sin. Getting angry about the right things in the right way is easier said than done. Sometimes we start well, uh, but we don't always finish well. One of my daughters recently was queuing up to get a, a train ticket and uh, a young guy from another nation was in front of her, uh, realized that before he could get his train ticket, he needed to disappear and do something quickly. He needed to get some other piece of information. So my daughter said to him, that's fine, I'll save your place in the queue, and when you come back, you can come in front of me, which he did. He disappeared off, came back, stood in front of my daughter, a woman in the queue behind said, oi! And uh, my daughter turned and said, it's okay, I, I said I would save the place for him. And, and this woman said, well, you didn't ask me. Uh, he comes and stands behind me. It's everyone for himself. And you know, when I, I heard that, I, I, I was angry. I wasn't even there. Uh, and I know my daughter was angry at the time. Uh, and this, that's right. That's, that's good. There should be a, an, a rightful indignation about that kind of situation. You, you think, what, whatever happened to kindness and community? What does that young man think about British culture? It's a, it's a shame to us in, in many ways. And, and that's a right kind of indignation. But you know, very, very easily, that anger can spill over into something else. So I find myself in those kind of situations, I'm then thinking, what I could have said that would have put that woman in her place? And I'm, I'm thinking that through in, in, in all kinds of ways. And suddenly, that, that rightful indignation has changed into something more ugly. I haven't actually given a thought to what that woman's life has been like. No thought about her at all. In fact, increasingly, the more I feed my mind with those kind of thoughts, what's, what's happening is I'm not even thinking about the guy in the queue that had to go and stand behind someone else. I'm thinking my opinion wasn't respected. She didn't do what I wanted her to do. She spoke to me rudely. And suddenly, what can start out as rightful indignation suddenly becomes very me-orientated. And, and so we need to know, what's going to help us to get angry in a pure way? That means when we're in situations like that, we can, we can transform them for good. And, and not for bad. And I think there's three things we can learn from Nehemiah about his anger. Firstly, his anger was compassionate. It was compassionate anger. You see, his involvement as governor in the nation, it, it, this wasn't just a, a career move for him. It wasn't duty. It wasn't just a, a project for him that he could impress people with. He wasn't seeking to make his mark in the world. He wasn't looking for advancement in terms of status and prestige. What comes through, if you, were, if you were listening to that chapter or if you know anything about this book, what comes through about Nehemiah is that he actually loved these people deeply that he was governing. He cared about their lives. He wanted the best for them. He was aware of the shame of the past. He was aware of the poverty that they were experienced. He knew that this rebuilding project that they were in, he knew the demands that it was making on them. And that's why, that's why I made reference to this carvery situation with the, the steak and the lamb and the chicken, if you notice that lay, later on. Uh, and, it, and it refers to the, the fact that he, he fed all those people weren't necessarily the poor. Uh, it, often it, it was other people from other nations that he had a responsibility as governor to, to look after. But the thing for you to understand about this was that as governor, it was, it was quite within his rights. He was entitled to tax his own people. So not only did they have the tax of the Persian king, but there was his tax as well. And this is what all the previous governors had been doing quite harshly. 
just another taxation system out of which he could, he could have an abundance of food. He could eat like a king and others with him. Nehemiah refused to do that. He didn't take what was his by right and entitlement, but out of his own pocket, he paid for this food. Now, it refers to 150 here, but it talks about plus others. It's reckoned that that amount of food would have probably fed six to 800 people every day. And he did that out of his own pocket because he knew how hard-pressed his people were. Now, that reflects something of the heart of God towards the poor. I want to read out a few verses from Exodus, which in, in, in some ways may be quite surprising to you, because often we can go down this line of, uh, of thinking, well, there's so much suffering in the world. Does God really care about the poor? Well, listen, this is, this is, this is how God does feel about the poor. In Exodus 22, he's, he's talking to uh, the, the nation of Israel and the leaders, uh, and he, he says this to them. He says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is, and it is his cloak for his body. In what else shall he sleep? And if he cries out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. That's the heart of God for the poor. He will hear the cry of one poor man who has gone without his cloak. That's the heart of God. He loves the poor. And Jesus, when he came as the Son of God, he demonstrated that same heart for the poor as well. There was an occasion in, in, in Jesus' life where he, he, he met a man with a shriveled hand, and it was a Saturday, the Sabbath day, and uh, there were religious leaders around Jesus, and uh, the, the Sabbath day f at, at that at that time, it was unlawful to do work on the Sabbath, and, and it would have been regarded as work to heal someone. And Jesus was there with all these religious leaders looking on. And it says he looked round at them because they knew he did, they did not want him on one level to heal that man. On another level, they did because they wanted him to get into trouble. But they, they didn't want to see someone healed on the Sabbath because they saw it was unlawful. And that made Jesus very angry. It was a compassionate anger. It says he looked round at them with anger in his heart. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. But you know how he expressed his anger? He reached out and he touched that man's shriveled hand and healed him. And in so doing, in that moment, actually, he, he, he really, in some respects, signed his own death warrant. Because it says in Mark 3, one of the Gospels, it, it says from that point on, they looked for an opportunity to put him to death. But he was willing to embrace that because his heart was one of care and love for the poor. I want to tell you about one thing that makes me angry. And uh, 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 it, it, it's something that um, I've, I've found for, for years. And it, it's not DIY or waiting in traffic jams. You know, those things do make me angry. Those are trivial, trivial things. One thing that really does make me angry with, our, with, with an, an indignation is if I go into a gathering of people, and this especially applies to church gatherings because I, I feel the church should be the friendliest place on the planet, but if I go into a gathering of people uh, and there are lots of little groups of people talking and enjoy each other's company, it makes me really angry when I see people excluded from that, when I see people on their own, somehow shut out from that. And those little groups, some of them may be aware of it, some of them may be unaware of it. I appreciate that. But there's something in me that, that makes me angry. And I, I know that plays back to where, when I was a teenager, and I, I felt very lonely. And I can remember time, uh, and again, going into context where I felt shut out and excluded from things. Because I, I know it's difficult to believe now, but I wasn't cool back then. <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't part of the in crowd. There were, 
you know, there were no particular cliques that I was part of. I was, I was very shut outside of that. And uh, there came a point in my teen years where I, I determined I, I, would not, I would not just feel sorry for myself any longer, but I would actually go into situations like that, and I would go and look for people that looked like me, and uh, I would speak to them. And, you know, uh, that's second nature to me now. And uh, I'm, I think it's remembering how I used to feel. That means that when I go into situations where I see little cliques of people uh, and people on their own, uh, it, I, I find that offensive. And I, want, I start to twitch, and I, and I want to do something, and I want to I wanna get to people. I want to help them to feel at home. And I tell you, I've met some wonderful people that way. You meet a few that you realize you, you understand why they were on their own. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's relatively few, because some people actually don't want someone to talk to them. But most people do. And, uh, and out of that, really, pattern over years, I've, I've made some good friends. And, uh, and, and God wants to do more of that in our hearts in terms of compassionate anger. Moving on from there, uh, Nehemiah's anger was not only compassionate, it was controlled. Uncontrolled anger is horrible. It's self-seeking, it's vicious and cruel. You, you will see daily examples of that in our newspapers, on, uh, on the internet, on our TV screens. And some of you have experienced that. You've been on the receiving end of uncontrolled anger. And therefore, me even talking about anger in this way makes you feel uneasy. I feel that could be misunderstood, and I appreciate that. But I, I do want to look at how... How can we control our anger so that instead of terrible expressions of it, we can, we can actually can control it in a way that means that, that that right kind of indignation doesn't lose its energy. Well, there's one, there's one mani anger management tip in this passage that I just briefly want to mention it. It says in verse 7 that Nehemiah took counsel with himself. It says he got very angry, but he took counsel with himself. In other words, he paused before exploding. And for some of you, that may be a practical piece of advice that you need to hear. Uh, management training uh, people were, would describe that as emotional agility. I don't know if you have emotional agility. They would say that's, a, that's, a, a, that's something that high-level leaders have, like Nehemiah, like Martin Luther King. It's the, it, it's the the ability to see an, an emotion arising and, and uh, like anger, but rather than exploding or rather than suppressing it, it's actually choosing what you do with it. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great thing to learn to do, emotional agility. But you know, if we were talking to Nehemiah today, I don't think he would actually be saying that was the number one thing that helped him control his anger. I think he would be saying that for him, it's what he calls the fear of God. A number of times in this chapter, he refers to the fear of God. And for him, what that meant was he knew that the authority that he had as governor was given to him by God. And it needed to be exercised under God's control. He also knew that God saw every single one of his actions, attitudes, motives, and thoughts, and that shaped the way he lived. Without that kind of God consciousness, it's so much easier for our anger to get misdirected and to get out of hand. Here are just two features of Nehemiah's fear of God. Firstly, he realized that oppression of the poor was first and foremost dishonoring to God. There's a proverb in the Old Testament that says this, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. You see, God is for the poor. Abuse the poor and you abuse God. The sad thing is, that mistreatment of the poor was the very thing that meant the nation of Israel had been taken into exile in the first place. It was like God's judgment on them because they were not looking after the poor. And yet here they are just coming back, starting to rebuild the nation, and already the seeds of the same issue are there. It just shows something of the poverty and the need of our hearts 
and, and how much we need the help of God to change our hearts. The second thing that indicates the fear of God in Nehemiah's life was that he was humble enough to admit his part in the whole issue. And it's amazing how many of those getting baptized said, I'm, I'm not perfect, you know. And uh, Nehemiah was willing to admit that, that, that he was not perfect. At some point, he got convicted in his own heart. He got very angry, but at some point, a conviction came in that actually, in some measure, he had contributed. And it was likely that he was making loans and taking pledges at this time, something that would be fine in normal circumstances, but in the terrible days with, with famine that were upon them, it, it wasn't right at that time. It, this was a time not for loans, but for gifts. And so Nehemiah realized that he had to do something himself. He wasn't just calling on others to change, he knew he had to change his as well. And you know, William Wilberforce, in terms of fighting for the abolition of slavery, he won many friends because of that same humility. He didn't come in with, a, with an arrogance or a judgmentalism. He came in with a, with a, with a humility that softened people's hearts. He, on introducing anti-slavery legislation, he said this, I mean not to accuse anyone, but to take the shame on myself. We are all guilty. You know, that is very Nehemiah-like, and that is so living in the fear of God. That kind of humility is rare, because actually, we, we, we tend to do something else. If we realize, or someone confronts us with something, uh, and is saying, yeah, actually, you're not doing that right, you know, we can respond in, in one of a couple of ways. We, we may defend ourselves, and as I've been speaking tonight, you may be feeling, well, I, I haven't oppressed or abused the poor in any way. That's not my problem. Well, what I want to say to you tonight is if there is poverty in our community, and somehow I'm overlooking that, and I'm not concerned about that or doing anything about that, then it is my problem. It, it certainly is my problem in God's eyes. And sometimes we don't just defend ourselves. We we will tend in situations where something is being leveled at us, we would tend to blame others. Uh, and, and so on this topic of poverty, we, we would, rather than looking in our own hearts and saying, well, how am I contributing to that? We would tend to blame the council, the, the politicians, the businessmen and women, the rich, and, and even the poor, uh, and say, well, actually, they, they, they must have chosen this route. They must have done something to deliberately get themselves in that kind of uh, situation. You know, we can often respond in those kind of ways instead of humbly looking at our hearts and saying, how have I myself contributed to these issues that are there in our culture? We need more of the fear of God. And finally, constructive anger. Not only compassionate anger, controlled anger, but we need constructive anger. And we find that Nehemiah used constructive means. You know, so many demonstrations and protests these days about very legitimate issues often end in terrible destruction of people's lives and property. We've seen that even recently, this week, in, on the streets of the Ukraine. But Nehemiah used government and social structures of the day to bring change. And uh, he brought charges, he gathered people in a great assembly, he involved the priests, and it, and it resulted in change. They couldn't withstand his arguments, it said they were silent. There was no blaming of others, there was no minimization, uh, there was no defensiveness, uh, and instead there was a sense of guilt. We've, we've got nothing we can say here. And immediately they returned land and property and loans, even interest. And it said they ordered it. Not just those that were the key offenders, they ordered it. There must have been something about Nehemiah's example of confessing his own part that triggered the whole community. And you know, that's when poverty really begins to change. It's not when a few say, this is, this is a problem. It's when the whole community says, this is our problem. We need to do something about this. No delay, we do it today. And that's what they did. And they found great joy in doing it. 
I just want to bring a few applications as we close tonight because I'm not naive enough to think that we can transform poverty overnight in Brighton. It's a huge need. It's a complex situation, an overwhelming one. But, you know, there are some small steps that we can take. And here is one of them. Start with your own heart. Recognize that actually there's a poverty in your own heart. I've identified some things tonight. It may be that you do have anger issues. It might be that your mentality is every man from himself. You're more concerned with anything about what's in it for you and your interests and, and your rights and all kinds of other motives and attitudes that really, to be honest, are, are shabby. You know, we cannot transform poverty in our culture until we see poverty transformed in our hearts. And some of you may be thinking, well, I've lived with this heart all my life. Who's going to help me with that? And I want to say to you, it's actually no good looking to the celebrities of the day, the heroes of the day, even the leaders of our day, because the closer you get to them, the more disappointing they turn out to be. But there is one person who's different, Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. You know, the closer you get to him, the more amazing he is. And I've spent nearly the last 50 years so far getting to know him more, and he is not disappointing. And I just want to read a verse out, which for some of you could be a life-changing verse tonight. It's from a, a, a book in the Bible, 2 Corinthians, New Testament. It says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, in other words, he came from the glory of heaven to earth, yet for your sake he became poor. He lived among us. He died a brutal death at our hands, though he did not deserve it. He did that so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And we've heard so many of those who have been baptized tonight saying, on the cross, he took, effectively, my poverty, my anger, my selfishness, and pride, and guilt, and all the punishment that I deserve for that. He, he took it. And instead of that, He's, he's given me things, not loaned me things for a bit, but fully and freely given me forgiveness and acceptance and peace and kindness. That's what God has done for us. That's good news. And if there's any of you here tonight that you know in your hearts, you know there's a poverty in my heart. There's, there's a sickness right at the root of my heart. And in your poverty, you want to cry out to God. You want to know one like this who will take all that stuff and give you freedom. Then you can cry out to him. Because, as we've heard tonight, he, he never rejects the cry of a poor person calling out to him. If you say, God, I need you. I need you to do something about the sickness in my heart. He will hear your cry tonight. And I encourage you to do that as we even draw to a close tonight. Some of you may feel, I just need to think this through more. That's absolutely fine. Maybe for you, coming along to the Alpha Course on Wednesday night will be a great next step for you. Just before we close, though, let me say two other things. Having looked at the poverty in your own heart, starting to do something about that, then in terms of transforming poverty, move on to those that are closest to you. Mother Teresa said this, what can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. And you know, many around us don't have families. One of the greatest forms of poverty in our culture is loneliness and people feeling unloved. And if we can reach out in some small way to those around us, we're beginning to alleviate some poverty. So look out for those around you that may be elderly, may be bereaved, may be sick, may be slaves to all kinds of things. And if you can love them and be a friend to them, if you can listen to them, if you can hear something of the cry of their heart, who knows what God might do through that. There may be people in your street, in your family, certainly people in this site, may even be people, if you were part of this church, in your midweek small group that need your help in that kind of way. And if you feel like you're one of those, that you are lonely, uh, you are poor in some ways, don't, don't just wait for that kind of help to come to you. 
You, you start to do that yourself with the very little that you have to give to others. You step out and do that as well because it's, it's often as you give that you find that you receive. And lastly, just in terms of the needs of our city, how can we, how can we do anything about that? Well, for some of you, maybe, maybe there is a role for you in terms of local government or getting involved in, in some kind of groups in this city that influence these kind of issues. Maybe God's calling some of you to that. There may be others of you that feel, I, I just want to do something this week. I, I just want to, I want to address something of this poverty issue in some small way. You know, Mother Teresa also uh, said this. She said, if you can't feed a hundred people, feed just one. And you know, together we can do more than that. And over the winter, we've been running a night shelter here, and it's going to run for a few more weeks. You know, we still need some help with that. And our hope is that when that night shelter comes to an end, later in this year, we'll be able to restart our drop-in facility that we used to run for the homeless. That used to get about 70 plus people, that we could provide food and friendship in that context. We'd love to relaunch that out of this night shelter. So if some of you are feeling, hey, I could do that, I would love to do that, then get hold of that connect card in front of you. It talks about serving opportunities. You may just want to cir circle the bit that says serving the city. And there's an immediate action you can take. I'm going to invite the musicians to come. And uh, we're going to, just in closing tonight, we're going to worship God for a while. But I want to encourage you to do something with the anger that I'm sure you all feel at times and uh, encourage you to believe that maybe even this week there will be situations that you touch that get transformed because of what God is doing in your heart at this time. God bless you. Let's, let's stand together and worship God.